Good afternoon, and we are live from COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. My name is Nadia Rossi. I am project director with Internews in Malaysia and a freelance environmental journalist. We are here today uh, for the live broadcast that have been brought to you by the Earth Journalism Network or EGN, a project of Internews and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security. They have also brought together 22 journalists from developing countries to cover the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties or COP26 as part of the Climate Change Media Partnership Program. This is an annual fellowship to the Climate Change Conference, conference which started in 2007, whereby the CCMP organizers believe that it is critical for journalists from low and middle income countries to have the opportunity to be here and report live from COP26. However, with the onset of COVID-19, it has been more difficult for journalists to come here and attend this uh, conference physically. Therefore, we hope that this live broadcast will serve as a resource for those who are covering this conference remotely. We have been hosting this broadcast since Monday, November 8th, and today is our last live broadcast where it will serve, uh, it, it will be more of a summary of what's been happening and also reflections from our fellows and our speakers on the conclusions and the discussions here at the conference. So for our first speaker, we have here um, Baktigul Tinibaeva from Azituk Media, Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, we can you know, uh, know more about uh, the fact that you, know, you are the only Central Asian journalist here covering mm -hmm. COP26. Um, perhaps you can share with us what's that been like uh, for you uh, being a fellow and also covering COP for the first time. Mm -hmm. And what kind of stories are you, know, are you writing back home and uh, what have you been looking at here at COP in terms of story ideas as well? Okay, first of all, I want to say thank you all the CCMP team for choosing me as our fellow, our fellow and for Earth Journalism Network, special my thanks. Uh, that was a huge opportunity for me to improve my knowledge on, as an environmental journalist attending uh, COP26. It's my first COP and I always was very, uh, curious uh, what cops look like, you know, and I always wanted to cover uh, cops um, issue, cop issues. So, um, as a Central Asian journalist here, uh, as a, uh, I was working alone, and that was uh, truly hard for me to cover everything uh, and to run around from delegations to media center and to briefings and everything else. But anyway, that was a big experience for me, huge experience for me to discover all these negotiations, adaptations and mitigations that were the new terms, uh, new terms, new, um, uh, as a new world for me to cover. And in the first day of COP, I, uh, I was here, this uh, high-level delegation uh, covering our president's speech. He made his speech in second day of the COP. Uh, our president, uh, Kyrgyzstan's president, Sadr Jabarov, was alone here from Central Asian countries as a leader. So he had his uh, nice, perfectly uh, nice uh, speech in uh, COP26. And, he pointed on um, uh, green, gas, uh, green gas emissions issues in Kyrgyzstan and glacier issues and mountainous um, and health problems or environmental problems of mountainous regions in Central Asia. Also, he said that uh, by 2015, we will move to uh, net zero uh, economy in Kyrgyzstan. But for this, he, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Central Asia overall needs international support. And he told on adaptation plans and mitigation plans, and he uh, accounted that it will take um, more seven billion dollars. So I made uh, live broadcasting from here when he was speaking, and also in the evening radio programs I made live live broadcasting and. Um, Mid midnight uh, newsroom. I made a night, a night broadcasting for TV, our TV program, and another day we made an analytical program for a half an hour from here on what's going on in the COP in a high level meetings and in high level briefings. So uh, I was in live with Bishkek uh, that time, and 
and those days I did lots of live streamings from here, photo stories and also future stories as well on um, uh, positive sides of implementing uh, climate uh, tackle issues from uh, several countries, for example, from Kenya. One of the activists, he was looking for some support, some financial support for the Kenyan farmers to buy a seed for, uh, you know, climate, uh, environmentally friendly um, you know, crop for farmers uh, that, that can grow without any, you know, water irrigation system, with only with um, rain. And that is very important for us as well as the Central Asian countries. Because uh, as Walt knows that in Kazakhstan this year, we have very huge problem on, on drought. So we didn't have enough water, uh, irrigation waters, um, uh, cattle has, uh, lots of cattle had died, so, and uh, we couldn't have enough uh, crop, uh, so that was a big issue, even our farmers came to government house to protest against government, uh, demanding irrigation water. So glaciers are melting, and we are having big issues, and uh, another thing is we have joined pavilion, Central Asian pavilion, and in this joined pavilion, uh, I, pre uh, I introduced our Azatpak Media's documentary film on glacier issues. That was that we uh, filmed this documentary in summer. Uh, uh, by 2015, according to scientists, uh, small glaciers in Central Asia, especially in Kyrgyzstan, Go, the, is going to disappear. So we um, filmed this issue. We went to small glaciers and big glaciers, and we accounted all these glaciers, how they are melting. And uh, here in first day of COP, we introduced this uh, documentary in our pavilion. That was huge, you know, uh, implementation from uh, us as a media. And in the last day of uh, our delegation's uh, uh, briefings and meetings, uh, Kyrgyzstan introduced uh, snow leopards uh, situation as, a, um, as an indicator of uh, climate change in overall Central Asia. And that was a big, a huge project. So, so I made some news stories on it. Also, I made uh, uh, video stories and uh, news on uh, how this protest going on here. Oh, she's been very busy. Yeah, uh, I've been very session. busy today, actually. I thought that I will be free no. and I will have enough time. But uh, even despite hope is ending, I need to wait for decisions. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to give um, some context to our audience here, uh, we are actually waiting for the informal planetary, planetary to start at 2.30, uh, where you know some resolutions are still being discussed and yeah. they're hoping to announce um, that you know, just in a few more minutes. So we are waiting for that. But based on the draft that you've seen, you know, uh, on the agreement, um, what are some of the the key kind of um, key key lines from the from the draft that you want to maybe follow up on? Because mm -hmm. I think they talk about adaptation, they talk about climate financing, they mm -hmm. talk about loss and damage as well. But what are uh, some of the the things from the agreement um, that you would like to pursue more of when you're back in Kyrgyzstan? I, will, I would like to research on how the decisions and how in these resolutions, they cover mountainous places, financing of mountainous places and uh, uh, financing uh, glacier issues. You know, Kyrgyzstan is a very small country, but uh, almost 90% uh, has covered these mountains and we have health problems linked to environmental issues with glaciers. So we have enough clean water, but we can't use it. We don't have, you know, uh, hydropowers uh, and hydropower uh, centers, enough hydropower centers to cover all of our, all our country. We have only six and a half million population, but we are suffering a lot from climate change. So I want to see in um, resolution how uh, UN uh, organizations will help to uh, countries such as Kyrgyzstan, such as poor and small countries. Kyrgyzstan, also Tajikistan is suffering a lot. Even uh, we are having some water fights in our borders. 
is our neighboring Central Asian countries, and it is very hard to, uh, you know, cope. Uh, recently, in the summer, we have uh, in the Spain, sorry, we have a lot of uh, issues with uh, Tajik, our Tajik neighbors, and we had a fight, we had clashes, more than clashes, and several people died, among them women and children, and it is very hard. It's getting day by day, uh, hard by hard, and hard for us to cope with climate change. So I would like to see how uh, UN will help to indigenous peoples and to yours and to mountains places. That's a big issue. And what are some of the challenges in, um, you know, as a journalist in reporting these stories um, back home? Um, is it the, the scale of the, the problem itself? Is it hard to communicate? Um, or is it because it transcends borders, as you mentioned? Or is it also because maybe in terms of uh, the public, they are, are not exposed to the topic of climate change? Like, uh, what, what have you observed you know, that, that remains um, obstacles in your work as a journalist? Thank you for the question. It's a very nice question. We have uh, several problems uh, on covering climate change issues. First of it, it's a uh, scientific based statistic information. We don't have enough of them. So we have old statistics and we don't have new ones. Uh, in our country or even in Central Asia, we don't have joined like scientific prognosing, uh, analytic, uh, analyzing uh, centers on climate change that they they can you know provide this uh, provide media with enough information so i need to um, look for general information for in worldwide how is going in kenya probably in africa and other side of uh, asia so i need to find out all the statistics from worldwide and then i need to uh, uh, you know, to make us like a structure in my country, because uh, when I am looking for scientists, climate change scientists, it's very few of them. Okay, I can count with my fingers. So it's the first problem, and second is unreachable uh, government uh, organizations. I'm not blaming them because they are changing very fast. They, in our country. You know, yesterday was someone uh, head of the ecology ministry, and today is uh, it's a completely different person. So we need to uh, always uh, in, uh, to get information from different different persons, and they are always new, and they don't know enough about the problems. So it's a second problem, and third problem is. We don't have enough information in Kyrgyz language, in our own native language, because we uh, only three and a half million people speak Kyrgyz. And other part of our country speak Russian. Russian is the official language, okay, but people who are suffering from climate change are living in mountains places, in rural places, and there they speak Kyrgyz. And they don't, they don't have enough information in their own language. And we need to always uh, implement and um, translate all information from English or Russian. And our um, climate activists don't speak Kyrgyz. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to reach them to their uh, population. Mm -hmm. That's a third problem. So it, it is really interesting. You, know, you talk about language, a difficulty to reach out to your policymakers. <laughs> And also, um, the scientific kind mm. of information that is still not very regional or, or not very comprehensive for you to actually make local stories on. Um, I feel that this is a recurring kind of uh, pattern that we see with uh, you know some of the fellows here who's uh, who's been uh, speaking to us at this live bro live broadcast and also outside of this live broadcast. Um, but maybe um, just as a final question, what kind of resources do you think? Uh, should be made available to journalists in Central Asia, uh, you know, considering that obviously you are the only one here covering. Mm. So what kind of resources do you think uh, you can benefit a lot more of? Like uh, what can maybe, uh, so are there any set, uh, specific trainings that you feel would definitely benefit you know, journalists in, in Central Asia? Um, what, what would you like to see more of in your region? Um, in my region, I yesterday made a live podcasting from my Facebook page as well about it. 
So mm -hmm. I asked my colleagues to learn more on environment issues, on climate change issues, because it's getting worse and worse. And this is a problem. This would be a problem over all of us, not only environmental journalists, you know. Uh, for example, in our outlet, we have enough group of environmental journalists. Uh, I have a uh, few colleagues they are covering this issue and they're covering very well. We are, you know, exchanging our uh, experiences. But I would like to uh, my uh, colleagues to learn more and to come to like, cop, like a cop style um, event more. So it would be very useful if uh, they, you know, change their course from political as a political journalist to environmental. And, uh, I don't think that uh, they would be, you know, lose a lot, but they would be very useful for future, for the health and for the prosperity, because uh, uh, we, we can't be, uh, you know, rich or we can't be prosper uh, if we are, you know, living behind environmental issues or climate change or healthcare. It would be very nice if they, you know, learn, and it would be so nice if uh, we implement more courses or uh, trainings for our Kyrgyz speaking journalists on environmental issues. Thank you so much uh, for, you. for everything that you shared with us. Um, here we call uh, Gul Betty. So thank you, Betty, for that. Thank you. Um, next, we are joined by our PCMP fellow as well, uh, Patricia Mary Rodos from Rattler Philippines, or PLIA, as we know her here at the fellowship. Um, so Pia, I think we can um, probably find out from you firstly, what has your experience here uh, at COP26? So, you know, what, what basically has any significant changes in terms of your learning curve or in terms of skills that you've gained maybe if you compare you know, day one to right now, the final day of, of the conference, hopefully. I would say that my experience has grown enormously, like 100%, like it doubled over the course of the two weeks we've been here. And it's really the dynamics. I think it's been, it's very hard to catch up with the dynamics between the blocks and then the, the fact that there are so many texts to compare. So I think that um, compared to the previous times I've covered other cops, this time I came more prepared because of the fellowship. And it was great that I had other mentors who are part of the fellowship and who are nerds about the cop because you know I'm not a nerd about it yet. So um, their years of experience has really enriched my coverage of the cop. Mm -hmm. And can you share with us like what kind of stories have you been, been pursuing here, which um, maybe aligns with the work you've always been doing at Rappler or any new topics as well that you've been exploring? So this COP, I really focused on number one, loss and damage, because mm -hmm. for the Philippines, it's a big issue. You know, like how do we cope? How does our economy cope with the huge devastation from storm surges, from sea level rise and typhoons, which are very common in the Philippines? So um, I was really following that. And so I got in touch with the negotiators who are pushing for, like, for example, the financial facility for loss and damage and also the Santiago network function. So I wrote stories about that. Um, also, I've been following the Philippine delegation because I'm a political reporter. So it was very important for me to um, explain to Filipinos what the government is doing here and what, how exactly they've contributed to the COP. But obviously, you know, COP is a very political kind of affair, you know, even with the kind of language that you're seeing in the agreements and, um, you know, the negotiations as well. What, what kind of advantage do you feel, you know, being someone who's always been reporting on politics? Do you find it easier to navigate these issues or do you find it's a whole different ballgame here at COP? I think that um, it's a big boon that I was a political reporter because, uh, for example, the head of delegation, the finance minister, is actually a close friend of the president's. So um, I've known him since 2015. So uh, that's why we were able to talk like on, on Viber, or, you know, like informally. Um, so that's a big boon. And also um, understanding that the delegation really just acts based on what the president says, right? Because the president is the head of state and government. So uh, knowing the, the president's issues, President Duterte's issues, it allows me to understand where the delegation is coming from and uh, the, the dynamics within the delegation. So I think um, it's been so useful for me, that political background. And I feel like, do, do you, would you agree that, you know, as a journalist, you know, from the Philippines, do you think that there's a lot more at stake, not in terms of just um, 
you writing stories about, uh, at, at court, but also what happens next, as in what kind of um, follow-ups or leads are you actually going to keep continuing um, to report on back home just because, like you said, the Philippines is such a vulnerable community and already seeing the impacts of climate change. Do you feel that that duty is, is a lot more to take on for a journalist from a developing country? Yes, I think that definitely after this COP, um, we, will, we can expect many more typhoons because the Philippines is hit by at least 20 typhoons a year. So, you know, like maybe five of that's a super typhoon. So that's definitely why we need to keep monitoring the COP and the loss and damage um, discussions. And also because uh, very soon our main source of natural gas is running out. So the big question is where do we get the electricity, the power to make up for that? So we're all watching to see, is, is it going to be coal or is it going to be renewable? Is it going to be a good mix? Is it, what's it going to be? And so just for a final question as well. So how are you trying to make this linkage, uh, linkages with the policies uh, and also the commitments and linking it back to maybe the promises uh, that has been made here by the delegation and maybe what the politicians will communicate uh, out of these kind of commitments? How do you kind of hold them accountable for the commitments they've made here at COP? Well, one way is to look at how the budget, the national budget, is deliberated because uh, we have one lawmaker who's a climate act advocate, Lauren Lagarde, the deputy house speaker, and she's been saying that our national budgets that we pass every year don't really show any ambition or any, it doesn't reflect our NDC. So I think it's very important to watch the budget because, you know, that's where we funnel our, our the taxes, like what investments are we making? Is it is it sustainable? Or are we just pouring it again into unsustainable practices? Are we actually funneling those funds to making communities resilient to storms and drought and intense heat? So um, so far, they, they, they're saying that they're not seeing that in the budget. And next year, definitely, I will be watching out for whether or not our MDC is reflected in the budget for next year. Thank you so much, Pia, for that. Um, so we have heard from our fellows. Now we would like to uh, go to our external speaker, Dr. George Carter, who is the Research Fellow, Geopolitics and Regionalism, Department of Pacific Affairs, College of Asia and the Pacific uh, from Australia. Uh, do we have George? Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, how are you? Amy? Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, George. Can Hi. you try again? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Just in one second. Oh, okay. It seems um, people online can hear me. I'm not sure if our host can hear me. Uh, George, sorry, we can't hear you. Um, I can hear you, but uh, also... We, we can hear George. Can... Nadia, we can hear George, but yeah. you cannot hear George. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that technical issues. <laughs> you, okay. Can you hear George? Yes, I can hear everyone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nadia, can you hear George? No, I still can't hear him. Okay, um, sorry, Josh, I will just uh, proceed with the asking the first question to you. Sure. Um, what, what have you been following, um, you know, at the plenary and what, what are some of your expectations basically with the resolutions that will be announced? Um, and what, what are some of the major themes that you're hoping will, will have a good resolution, uh, resolution for, for the Pacific Islands? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone, for welcoming me, for having me on your program today. George Ney, George Carter, Glasgow. Sorry, I had to say that in my uh, indigenous language so that uh, my media uh, people in Samoa, but also across the Pacific, can hear me. Um, I've been following the issue on Article 6 uh, for the Pacific Island delegations here as part of. Uh, the Secretary of Pacific Region Environmental Program, SPRIP program, under the new way delegation. Um, I'm actually talking to you right now inside the um, 
uh, in formal plenary where we are anticipating what could be hope you know we're not we're hopeful but it could be the final um, uh, of COP although there could be changes in the program and we could see um, negotiations going on to six o'clock. So it's either we see a finalization of the um, COP decisions um, by 2.30, well, it's now 3.30 um, or not. Um, you know, earlier today, the, the draft number three for not only uh, remaining issues on uh, the rule book were released, but also the cover decision or the COP decisions, as well as the CMA decisions were released this morning at 8 a.m. Parties were given the opportunity to think about what they, if they have any objections. Now, um, then there was supposed to be a meeting at 10 a.m., which was then pushed back to 1 p.m. And now we still have uh, parties who are uh, still going through them, uh, whether they can take this on board. It's now pushed back to 2.30. So, uh, Maybe very soon, um, as you can sort of see in the images here behind us, um, uh, parties are quickly in, I mean, uh, sort of all in their um, different huddle groups, through regional groupings, or whether it be countries. We can see John Kerry of the United States walking around, talking to individual parties. We can see African countries uh, communicating with each other through what's known as negotiation huddles. We can see the ever group um, in anticipation moving from group to group, trying to find out whether these countries will, um, will there be an objection? Because that is tentatively what's happening at the moment. We, you know, within the research that we have conducted, uh, consensus, it's not about agreement. Consensus in multilateral decision-making is about when parties agree not to disagree. And we are at that, what I call in my research, and it's the consensus point, because it's been laid out to parties. And part, if one party, you know, has a, a difference or disagreement or pulls out altogether, then the whole system collapses, you know, that we have failed. And so uh, what we are trying to attempt basically as of today is to find out if that no party has no disagreements. And um, at the moment, the, the draw, I mean, the reason why there was a delay from 10 a.m. to the now 2.30 p.m. is that there's still few parties who may have some disagreements. Um, and it could be about just tidying up the general language. And that's why you have this flurry of activity of uh, at all corners of the plenary uh, with uh, uh, ministers as well as negotiators trying to appease uh, those parties with disagreements. Now, for the Pacific, uh, you know, following their work, they came into these negotiations with uh, five key main messages to try and accomplish here in um, Glasgow. One is interior in terms of finance, that there's access to finance, that there's long-term financing, as well as ensuring that um, there's additional financing in terms of not just for adaptation, but also for loss and damage. In the area of loss and damage, that this issue is uh, given its priority in terms of it has its own facility of funding uh, that addresses these issues on irreversible losses due to uh, 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 the loss of uh, resources uh, that is beyond adaptation. This is fundamental in terms of economic losses that Pacific countries will under face, but also cultural losses in terms of migration. And so this is fundamental at been uh, pursued by the Pacific. Beyond that uh, is the area of oceans that is embedded or discussed within um, uh, within UNHCRC, um, and then its area of environmental integrity. That discussion around uh, carbon markets and um, uh, non-carbon mechanisms that they uphold in environmental integrity. Uh, and those all these key messages uh, have what been pursued and. Uh, for the last two, three weeks, but as well throughout the last two years in the in, um, subsidiary bodies, uh, the delegations from the Pacific have been underway. And part and parcel of this um, whole enterprise of Pacific delegates is the work of media. And we're very grateful, um, you know, as someone from within the delegation uh, groups, but also helping coordinating Pacific uh, messaging here at, uh, in Glasgow. It's a work of our five key media personnel, 
as well as our media from Pacific Island Forum and our media at Sprip, who are not only based here, but working from Inbook Islands or working from Samoa to try and elevate these messages uh, to our local uh, and regional uh, media, but also in trying to get that message elevated to uh, global um, media, such as BBC, CNN. Um, and so that's sort of not only what's happening, you know, sort of short message of what's happening right now, uh, but also the work of how um, media is in, uh, in part, uh, part and parcel of what we call the um, uh, one crop, but also the Pacific voyage here to uh, Glasgow. Uh, so, Josh, uh, so Josh, just talking uh, about what you were saying about messaging and the role of media as well. Um, you know, if we for, for this fellowship, um, you know, we have journalists coming from the global south. Uh, who understand these issues really well just because they are from communities that are you know the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and I feel like you know the angles of the stories are really resonate back home just because you know they are in the front lines of that um, you know you did mention about taking these stories to more international platforms um, so what would you advise maybe journalists who are not from the global south and developing countries like what should they be covering when they talk about these kind of issues like what kind of uh, messaging should they use because sometimes there is a disconnect just because the readers are so far away and so distant from from the real issues on the ground absolutely you know it's um it, i'm very happy that you know in terms of uh, what's been covered by international media have been the voices of leaders in terms of articulating uh, the vulnerability of our communities the vulnerability of our countries and, and, and um, and, uh, you know, we've seen uh, strong messaging by leaders in times, the plenary meetings, or we've seen ministers um, half deep in water, or, you know, so they've been able to get, capture that. What I would love the international media to also capture are the solutions that are offered from within uh, the Pacific, but the rest of global south, that we are a source of innovation, we are a source of solutions to the climate change. And it may not be the big wind turbines, but it's the simple technology. It's the impact of how community uh, work together. It's how it's that grassroots. And I wish, you know, although we can't see that here in these rooms, but it's it's vital and important that um, that we connect the vulnerability to the solutions and the innovations that are provided by the global self. Because you know, I live in Canberra, and when I, you know, when I you know, when experience a disaster or natural disaster in Canberra, whether it's a fire. Um, what I don't see, what I see the uh, effort that's provided by the national governments and state governments in terms of their response. What I do not see necessarily at times is the strength of local community uh, and the strength of individuals to adapt, um, you know, and which has come so natural to all of us who also are from uh, the global south, who are uh, face global imp uh, these impacts of climate change, who have that experience, who have that uh, resilience, and these are, I believe, lessons that the world could actually learn on: is how to mobilize local communities to not be necessarily dependent on the national governments or state governments for for these resources. And I think if we can connect those stories while we have that platform in doing these UNFCCC, that will be fantastic in terms of elevating those stories as one of many that I know um, others will be uh, suggesting and how international media can get our stories out. So I guess for, for my last question to you, George, is that uh, what do you think are the, the topics that you know, the Pacific Island communities are most concerned about where they, they, where they feel it's a bit underreported um, can you maybe share some of the, that perspective? Um, well, I'll frame this in terms of just UNFCC negotiations. Uh, you know, one of the things that has been reported by um, our personnel, but also tweets and messages that um, we, we have seen and, you know, in the last two weeks are what happens inside. Uh, I mean, it's it's great that we, we everyone has seen the protests and they, you know, they, they see that is a fundamental part of the UNFCC, but it's the inside stories, which I believe the media currently covers, but I, we need more, you know, we need more fellowships, um, you know, by uh, 
uh, your group, you know, the Media Partnership uh, Reporting Fellowship from the Global South. But we really need more Pacific media uh, uh, here as well to cover the stories of how negotiators, what negotiators are doing, what leaders are doing. Um, and, you know, with the Pacific delegations, there's a general partnership that there's a respect for media in trying to get that story because uh, our citizens are looking at, you know, the work that negotiators are doing. They're, they're wanting to know. But all they're hearing is sort of BBC reflection or the CNN reflection. But what our communities and our countries are, they want to hear what the Philippines' perspective is of what's actually happening. You know, there's a daunting story that we're losing or we're not, you know, you know these issues. Or, but the story of what happens inside really needs to get there. But also in our local languages. I think that's also very important that English uh, may be the main story that goes up, but we need our people to hear it in Swahili. They needed to hear it in Samoan. They need to hear it in Tongan, you know, all the languages. So it's important that the global South media and also our indigenous languages are uh, in these rooms and corridors reporting on these issues um, and that they're not just hearing on from the big um, stations. Um, and so I hope um, the fellowship can also increase the numbers for more global South, but also more numbers for uh, Pacific media pro uh, groups that so that they're able to report back in terms of action. I mean, the activity as it happens, the issues that it happens, but also in the languages which our listeners and our audiences are familiar with. Thank you so much, George. Josh. Uh, thank you so much, George, for that. Uh, I feel that you know we we definitely understand. Uh, the, the limitations, but also the opportunities um, that you know journalists uh, will be able to get if they do more local stories and linking all these kind of global commitments to localized solutions as well. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we will leave you now to follow the, the discussions at the planetary uh, the plenary. Sorry. Uh, so thank you so much and um, see you see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that is all from us here uh, at Life uh, from COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of the Climate Change Media Partnership Program brought to you by Earth Journalism Network Internews and also the Stanley Media Center for Peace. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if, if you have been joining us since Monday, thank you so much. And um, we hope you will continue to follow um, developments here at COP26 and also stories by our fellows at our website, www.earthjournalism.com. Uh, .net slash COP26. And um, please uh, visit the website if you would like to find additional resources, links to uh, journalism and also climate journalism and also tip sheets uh, for your work as a journalist. So thank you so much. Uh, it has been a pleasure to bring you uh, this live broadcast from COP26 this year. And please leave your comments uh, if you have any suggestions for us on how to improve this live broadcast uh, for future uh, future cops as well. So thank you so much and stay safe. <laughs>